Hi, welcome back to the Lee Kempner House in Galveston, Texas. And I'm Janie, and I want to talk to you today about our electrical service. We've been doing a lot of work on the structural part of the house. We went through my checklist of safety, security, structural, and if we ever get past structural, we'll move into systems. Well, the electrical system is one of those systems that we named in that list. And there's already been a little bit of work done and that was done early, early on. Let me show you why and what we did. Let's back up a little bit and talk about just electricity in general in this house. It was wired for electricity when it was built. It was very modern, technologically advanced, but it's the old knob and tube wiring. And we've seen examples of that here up in the cupola area and up in the attic. Let's go back and take a quick peek at what we saw up there. Here's some of the old knob and tube wiring. You can see it was held on by a ceramic insulator. And then there's a ceramic insulator that they drilled a hole and put through the stud to keep that wire from touching the wood. Um, you can see a good example of the old knob and tube wiring up here where they had these ceramic knobs that carried the hot wire. And there's a tube that goes through the joist to insulate the joist from the live power. There's also a more modern cloth woven covered strand. So you can quickly see why it's called knob and tube wiring because the tube was the ceramic that went through the wood. The knob was the insulator that was screwed on the outside of wood to string wire between. The purpose of all that insulation was to keep the wire from touching the wood itself. We also saw down in the basement many other forms of electrical wiring kind of stepping through time showing the progression because this house was updated and as you got more electrical appliances and things that use more electricity, you needed more capacity. So they would add plugs and outlets and upgrade wiring. So all of that was going on and it was just a jumbled mess. There are a lot of other types of wiring evident throughout this house. Knob and tube wiring came about about 1880 and you still find it in houses today, although it's not legal in a lot of jurisdictions. But there are also telephone wires. Those came about in about 1876. They're very low voltage. There's telephone wire obviously between the poles, but in the house there are doorbell wires, servant call button wires. I even found a mechanism embedded in the side of the windows in the alcove that I think is part of an early burglar alarm system that had hardwired connections to it. One really cool thing I found in the basement was this big transformer where the power came into the house that actually was stepped down by its own transformer before going into the breaker panel interior to the house. I haven't had time to research it, but I'm definitely going to save this old transformer and put it on display in the house. It's hard to see because I don't have continuous footage, but you get the idea that this house was just a jumbled mess of electrical service that was added onto, added onto, added onto, and all deteriorating in bad shape, and it clearly needs to come out and be replaced. There was also evidence, I think I've shown you before, of two or three places where electrical fires had actually started and then fortunately extinguished themselves because the wood was so wet from the leaks in the house that it didn't spread. Anyway, that jumbled mess of, of electrical, I don't know what you call it in there, it was just a disaster, just a, a web of old wires and everything. It's unsafe and we saw evidence of a couple of electrical fires and it all needed to come out and be redone as part of the renovation of this house. And normally, as I said on my list, I would do that later on. But the problem is we need electricity to work here. We could have generators and power our equipment, but that just doesn't make sense. So normally on a big job like this, you come in and put in a temporary electric service. And that's what we did. Our service actually comes from a pole over near the apartments.
and ran above ground and connected to the house up here. You can still see remnants of where a bar was connected. Let me show you an old picture of that. Part of the problem was is from where I'm standing, I could almost reach up and touch those wires and I'm not a very tall person and that's very unsafe. So we had to get that down. We could not use that as part of our temporary service. So so since we had to install that temporary service, we went ahead and elected to go ahead and bury our permanent service under the ground, take down those old wires and get at least the boxes installed on the outside of the house. So this is happening today. The guys have been digging. They are so fast. They've done this in probably two hours. Fortunately, the soil down here is sandy and not clay. This is for the direct bury of the new electrical service coming in so we can get rid of these overhead lines. They're so close to the ground you can reach up and touch them. Not a good thing. They still have to go through the concrete. And then they'll come out here by the drain and mount the meter can and then go inside. It was a relatively short run to dig, but you notice we always dig by hand. We don't use any type of machinery, and that's because we always find things in the ground that we don't know we are there, there, and we don't want to accidentally we cut through anything, anything or do any damage. No. <laughs> One of the things we found in here was some old clay sewer pipe. Where's all that water coming from? Just uh, from? I think it's coming out from that, the big pipe. Ah, uh, the big pipe? Yeah, it's got a small crack and it's coming out through there. Mm. Okay, we've dug down three feet. You can see the sand layer where this area was filled after the 1900 hurricane. And we found some kind of large brick terracotta structure that they filled over. Not a clue. All right, this is Nathan working on the electrical. We're going underground from the service pole and putting the meter can on the house instead of out of the pole. Unfortunately, the trench that the guys dug yesterday is now full of water. While Nathan worked on getting the conduit laid in the trench, Dan undertook removing the old electrical service from the wall and getting the new boxes mounted on the wall. This was actually a pretty lengthy process. I apologize for not getting more video. It took at least two full days to get all this work done. The electrical inspector just left. We passed inspection and now have temporary power and we are cleared to fill the trench. So given that I'm the unskilled labor and I'm free, I'm gonna get started. Just another quick shot showing how the house was originally built at grade level. You can see the exterior wall extending down and actually below that water line. All of that was originally above ground and this was all filled in after the 1900 hurricane. So it looks like approximately three feet of fill at this point. And then up to ground level today. And it's almost like it never happened.
you notice, this is a Whopper panel. This is a 400 amp circuit, and we may actually add even another 200 amp second service to this just for the apartments. This is a big house that's going to have 35 tons of AC and heating in it. It needs a lot of power for modern conveniences. So this work was done within a month or so of buying the house. This pole is where the original service was attached at the top. And I don't know why, but the wires came down to a meter can, then back up the pole into the house. So the meter was actually housed out here in this box. The problem was the box cover was missing and all those wires were exposed. Somebody could have touched any of that and electrocuted themselves. So we needed to get this not to be live power. So that's another reason we elected to go ahead and bring in our permanent service so that we could run this big conduit down the side and put our service in there. And we actually have a smaller conduit coming down that brings our temporary service down through this conduit and over to a temporary meter pole. So on the other side here, we have our temporary power source. It's got breakers in it and everything runs through the conduit in the house. And we have a live plug on every floor and on the ground floor that we can plug in drills and saws and compressors and everything and use to run power. And then we also have a circuit added in there that has two or three lights on every floor for safety and for security. So this is what we've been using. This will stay until we get the house rewired and all the new wires run to the new breaker boxes on the outside of the house. <laughs> and I'm laughing because my sister is over there doing this like this where there's like a million <laughs> <laughs> there's like a million, million mosquitoes. mosquitoes and we are it drenched like we are drenched with mosquito spray oh no you brought them with you <laughs> go away i'm sharing she's sharing anyway they're horrible 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 <laughs> and it's december and they really shouldn't be here but we're having very mild weather and we just had a lot of rain so it's like they're freeze dried and then they come back to life and eat you up but anyway this is our new and safer electric service so that's one reason it was kind of up at the top of the list and that we didn't make do with just the temp we needed to get the live wires out of here and get this secured <laughs> now that you understand a little bit about our temporary service and what's going on let me tell you a couple of exciting things and kind of bad thing about the electrical service um, i put this in before I knew I was going to make this a nonprofit, before I had an idea about the apartments in the basement. And it's one reason you don't want to jump ahead and design until you really know what the use of the house will be. Because now we're a little bit worried that this may be just slightly undersized. It's probably big enough. But uh, the exciting part is I have an electrician who's on the island, a young man, who's volunteered to pull the wiring in this house for free if we buy the materials. And He's been working with me and coming in and consulting and talking about the layout of the house and things we can do. And he's come up with a brilliant idea. And that's to add another meter or second service for just the apartments. And we'll do that by not bringing in another wire from the pole, but we'll cut here and put something called a gutter across that will split the wires coming up in this conduit and place another meter over here for the apartments. We're also going to change where it enters the house. We're going to take this down and we're going to come out the side and go this way because we've now designed a mechanical room in the center of the basement that will house all the sub panels. And that's why I'm in a big rush, not a rush, but that's why it's a critical path item to get the basement floor done, to fix all the plumbing issues, fix the water issues and get that floor poured because we need the floor before we can build the walls. We need the walls before we can hang the sub panels and we need the sub panels before we start pulling the wire. So that's kind of an introduction to critical path scheduling. And I know I seem to jump around and work on different things, but there's a method to the madness and you can never lose sight of that critical path. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a later video, but I just wanted to share with you that this is very exciting that we're moving from the structural work. You know, we did that safety, structural, and systems. We're moving into the big 
systems work and that is a game changer for the house so i'm very very excited about that so be sure and subscribe and turn on your notifications because there's a lot going on we're slowing down on some things but we're ramping up on others there will be more videos coming out about all the workings going on in the house please turn on your notifications and subscribe so you don't miss anything it also helps us on youtube that you're watching because as a 501c3 nonprofit those ad revenues support us in the work we're doing in this house. So thanks for watching. You're helping this house just by being there. Here we are on a walkabout. And I want to show you this house because I did have the good fortune to go inside and meet the owners and take a really neat tour of the house. It's just fabulous. And I have a few pictures inside I can show you. The couple that owns this house have taken a slow and steady approach to the restoration. And I call it a restoration because they've been meticulous in using original materials and not making alterations to the house. They've done an absolutely phenomenal job. One of the most incredible things they've done, though, I think is on the outside. Look at that wrought iron. Let me tell you a little bit about the work that's been done before we go up and read the plaque on it. See all that wrought iron? The old wrought iron was severely damaged and they took it down and had it molded and replicated at a foundry and put back. So I just can't even begin to imagine what that would have cost. But look at the tile details above the windows. And it's got this incredible tower. I do have a couple of pictures of the interior of that. And then the fish scale on top of the turret in the original slate. This odd little, I don't know what it is, round corner decoration. Used to have a pointed cap on it. It's down right now, and the owners are going to have it replicated in copper and put back on. It's just a highly unusual house. This is the Landis McDonough House, Confederate veteran and capitalist Henry A. Landis, 1884. <laughs> I cannot read. I cannot read. Let me, <laughs> let me try again. The Landis McDonough House. Confederate veteran and capitalist Henry A. Landis, 1844 to 1919, had this house built in 1887 to 1888. Designed by prominent architect George E. Dickey of Houston and D.A. Helmick, the house reportedly provided refuge to some 200 people during the disastrous 1900 hurricane. John P. McDonough, owner of a dry docks and ironworks business, hence the ironwork on the house, Purchased the property in 1911. Acquired by the Dominican Sisters in 1954, it housed a fine arts center for a number of years. The eclectic Victorian structure features Romanesque style accents in its fine ornamental terracotta brick and ironwork and its exuberant parapet and towers. This house looks different from every angle. You would think from the way it's sitting that the door would be facing the corner, but it doesn't. It actually faces the south side. Here we are at the back of the house, and it looks to me like this whole wooden structure was an add-on that was done later. I can't remember what they told me in the tour, but this is the carriage house, and you can see it's had a lot of rebuilding. This whole back wall had to be replaced. It has a new slate roof. And it's still in process. But look at that copper guttering. They've really done a beautiful job with this house. The house is very busy on the outside. There's so much going on architecturally. You just have to stand there for several minutes and take it all in. The brickwork is crazy complicated. And there's this incredible tile that you find above the windows. Even the guttering is done like you would have seen it in the 1800s. Look at this copper scupper. Sort of like the Lee Kempner house, there are flat roofs and peaked roofs to deal with. There's just a lot going on. I don't even know that this house has a style. 
this is cute that's the ike water line which is about even with the top of my head Inside, most of the original features remain, and where the originals were missing, authentic period pieces have been added in their place, such as this incredible light fixture. Since this is someone's private home, I don't want to show too much of their personal space, but here are some of the other features that I just found fabulous. The owners had the ceiling painted in the dining room. It's just stunning. The house is just as ornate inside as it is on the outside. I think every decorative technique known to the Victorians was used in this house. Look at this hardware. The front doors are ornately carved, and it's rumored that the two faces that appear on the door are that of the original builder's brother who died young and also a son that was lost as a child. The stained glass windows are just breathtaking. The staircase is very unique, and this is an inset of embossed Lincresta. I'm going to deviate a little bit and have a history lesson. Lincresta was invented by Frederick Wilson, the same man that developed linoleum in the 1860s, and you've seen examples of that early, early linoleum down in the Lee Kempner house. Well, in 1877, he came up with Lincresta. Just like linoleum, Lincresta is made by mixing linseed oil gel with wood flour. Wood flour is nothing more than just finely ground wood. Think fine sawdust. The mixture was spread onto a paper base and then rolled between steel rollers, one of which has a pattern embossed on it, which creates the pattern in the Lincresta. The linseed gel continues to dry for many years, so the surface just gets harder over time. It can also cause it to deteriorate with age because it will get so hard that it will crack. But this Lincrest is in pretty good shape. It can be painted over and used in a number of applications. Heritage Wall Coverings Limited acquired Lincrest's operating assets in 2014. So Lincrest is still produced in England today using the original traditional methods. Lincresta is often confused with anaglypta, which is a more flexible, heavily embossed wallpaper. And here's a fun fact. Anaglypta was developed by an employee of Frederick Walton. The employee felt that Lincresta was too rigid and that a more flexible product was needed so that it could have broader application. Frederick Walton didn't like the idea, so the employee struck out on his own and became a competitor. Here's a picture of the inside of that turret that was on the front. If you've been watching the Lee Kempner House videos, it should remind you of the condition that the alcove off the parlor was in. Like our alcove, this space has been structurally repaired and repointed, and it's now ready to be finished out. One of the most amazing things I saw in this house was in the basement or ground floor. Okay, I can't believe this. This is one of the old spider old furnaces. <gasps> mm -hmm. That's old asbestos. That's the that aspect. is probably what I had. Even outside there were so many little details to take in like this trim on the brick that made up the sidewalk. But perhaps my favorite thing in the house was this incredible Pullman sink. Okay, oh my gosh, what is that? It's a Pullman sink. <gasps> oh, how cute is that? There's one like it in the Bishop's Palace. I have to thank the owners for letting me take a peek inside and giving me permission to take a few pictures. They love this house as much as I love the Lee Kempner house, and as I said, they have poured their heart and soul into restoring it and preserving it for future generations. I hope you enjoyed the walkabout today, and now on to some sister outtakes. I'll be your moral support. Okay. I'm your emotional support sister. Well, I'm going to talk. I'm gonna talk. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need a vest? No. A harness. <laughs> a harness. A muzzle. <laughs> okay. okay. This never works well. Okay. Quiet. No giggling. And action. Okay. <laughs> it's not gonna work. I understand. Okay. Oh no. Okay. It's just the idea of it. Of it. Okay. Hi, welcome back to the J. No, it's not the J. Okay. <laughs>